Now CBS This Morning co-host Charlie Rose on assignment for 60 Minutes. Tonight we're going to introduce you to one of the most innovative thinkers of our time. He is a man who has had an enormous impact on our everyday lives. David Kelly is the founder of the Silicon Valley global design firm IDEO. His company has created thousands of breakthrough inventions, including the first computer mouse from Apple, the stand-up toothpaste tube, and a better Pringle for Procter & Gamble. Audio may be the most influential product design company in the world. Kelly was a longtime friend and colleague of Steve Jobs, and he is a pioneer in something known as design thinking, an innovative approach that incorporates human behavior into design. The story will continue in a moment. The big thing about design thinking is it allows people to build on the other, the ideas of others. Instead of, instead of just having this one thread, you think about it, I come up with an idea and then somebody from somewhere else says, oh, that makes me think we should do this. And then we could do that. And then you get to a place that you just can't get to in one mind. If you follow David Kelly around IDEO, you can see how he has infused that thinking into the legendary Palo Alto firm he founded more than 20 years ago. Breakthrough ideas happen every day here. The key to unlocking creativity at IDEO may be their unorthodox approach to problem solving. They throw a bunch of people with different backgrounds together in a room. So you're in the business end? Yep. My background's in software engineering. Journalism. Aerospace engineer. Doctors, opera singers, and anthropologists, for example, and get them to brainstorm. You gotta have a certain culture. You gotta have collaboration. You gotta have diversity. You gotta have an anthropologist and a business person and an engineer and a computer scientist, all of you those got kinds it. of. You got it. That's the hard part is the cultural thing of having a diverse group of people and having them be good at building on each other's ideas. They encourage wild ideas and visualize solutions by making actual prototypes. But the main tenant is empathy for the consumer, figuring out what humans really want by watching them. If you want to improve a piece of software, all you have to do is watch people using it and see when they grimace and then correlate that to where they are in the software and you can fix that, right? And so the thing is to really build empathy, try to understand people through observing them. In other words, their experience will communicate what you need to focus yep, on. Yeah, exactly. It is a concept that had its genesis in 1978 when Kelly and some Stanford pals took the notion of mixing human behavior and design and started the company that would eventually become IDEO. One of their first clients was the owner of a fast-growing personal computer manufacturer by the name of Steve Jobs. He made IDEO because he was such a good client. We did our best work for him. We became friends, and he'd call me at 3 o'clock in the morning. At 3 a.m. Yeah, we were both bachelors, so we knew he could call me, right? Yeah. So he'd call me at 3 o'clock, and he'd, and he'd just, like, with no preamble, hey, it's Steve. First I knew if it was 3 o'clock in the morning, it was him. <laughs> and there's no preamble, and he'd just start. He said, you know those screws that we're using to hold the two thing on the inside? I mean, he was deep into every aspect of things. Kelly's company helped design dozens of products for Apple, including Apple III and Lisa, and the very first Apple Mouse, a descendant of which is still in use today. He said to us, you know, for $17, make, I want you to, he gave us that number, $17, I want you to make a mouse that we're going to use in all of our computers. Mm -hmm. So what happened here was we're trying to figure out how to make, so you move your hand and how you make the thing move on screen. So at first we thought, we've got to make it really accurate. You know, like when we move the mouse an inch, that's got to move exactly an inch on the screen. Mm. And then after we prototyped it, we realized it doesn't matter at all. Your brain's in the loop. The whole thing was make it intuitive for the human. In fact, but even after they funny. solved that you know, monumental problem, Jobs still wasn't satisfied. And so he didn't like the way the ball sounded on the table. So we had to rubber coat the ball. Well, c rubber coating the ball was a huge technical problem because you can't have any seams. You got to get it just right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it'd just be one thing like that. Well, suppose Steve had said to you, uh, I'd like to have a ball that's not steel but rubber coated. And you said, no, you can't do that, Steve. What would he say? The explanatives that I would have would probably are not good on, <laughs> on camera, but it was basically, I thought you were good. You know, like I, I thought I hired you because you were smart. You know, like you're letting me down. Since then, design thinking has led to thousands of breakthroughs, 
from redesigning Xylus kitchen tools so they're easier to use to coming up with a heart defibrillator that talks to you during an emergency. So it talks to you and it shows you visually what to do. And they came up with TiVo's thumbs up, thumbs down button. It makes your TV smarter, right? Because you, you give it the thumbs up or thumbs down and your TV learns what you like and what you don't like. It's why Steelcase, a company that has been building furniture for 100 years, turned to IDEO to reinvent the classroom chair. This is one of my favorite things. I want you to sit in this oh, chair. Oh, I love this. So really this is for kids, yeah. right? So we well, I'm a kid, so yes, there you right. go. You're perfect. <laughs> so when we looked at that old wooden thing with the dog egg yeah, leg yeah, kind of stuff, right. and if you just watch kids and see what they need, what do they need? Well, the main thing they need is a place to put their backpack, Yeah. right? So right, you got right. a place to put your backpack. And then they yeah, need it to, right there. they're fidgety. They want to move around, yeah. so you put it on wheels, right? Yeah. And, they, and getting in and out of it, yeah. you know, you need to this. So yeah. it's, it's not rocket science, it's what? It's empathy. Empathetic. Empathetic. It's empathetic to people. Like really, like try to really understand what they really value. Now they're working with clients all over the globe. They're using the same intuitive human point of view to improve access to safe drinking water in India and Africa, redesigning school systems in Peru, and helping North Face expand their brand into China. Kelly has always been good at coming up with ingenious solutions to everyday problems. His first job was at Boeing. He was part of a team that designed the lights around the passenger windows, as well as a milestone in aviation history, the laboratory occupied sign. But he says the seeds of who he is today can be traced to his childhood in Barberton, Ohio, the passenger tire capital of the world, where he learned the value of building with his hands. In my family, if the washer broke, you didn't go order the part. You went down toward the washer part and tried to make a new part to fix it because mm -hmm. that was part of the um, that was part of the game that you know we're capable of fixing things. And that was something that was part of you too. You were a tinkerer who wanted to take it apart and put it yeah, back. Yeah, one together. of the best stories my mother tells. I took the family piano apart, but it wasn't that interesting <laughs> to put it back together. So it just it kind of, the piano sat there with this big harp kind of thing hanging out of it for yeah. most of my childhood. <laughs> He was in his 20s, working unhappily as an engineer, when he heard about Stanford University's product design program. What he learned there would transform his life as a design thinker. And so what happened when you came to Stanford? So I get to Stanford, and, um, and uh, it was heaven. Stanford was the synthesis of kind of art and engineering, and it was wonderful. It was shortly after that that Steve Jobs came into the picture. For over 30 years, they worked together and were close friends. What's the biggest misconception about him? I think the, big, the misconception is around that he was kind of like, um, you know, like malicious. He was like trying to be mean to people. He wasn't. He was just trying to get things done, right? And it was, you just had to learn how to react to that. And he did some lovely things for me in my life. Jobs introduced Kelly to his wife, Casey Branscombe. And Steve Jobs was also there for Kelly when the unthinkable happened. In 2007, Kelly was diagnosed with throat cancer and given a 40% chance of survival. Jobs, already suffering from his own deadly cancer, gave him some advice. He came over and said, look, you know, don't consider any alternative. Go straight to Western medicine. Don't, you know, don't try any herbs or anything. Why do you think Steve said, don't look for alternative medicine, go straight to the hard stuff? I think he had made, in his mind, he had made the mistake that he had, uh, had tried to, to cure his, his pancreatic cancer in other ways other than, I mean, he just said, don't mess around. You know, when we both had cancer at the same time was when um, I got in really close to him and I was at home, you know, like sitting around in my skivvies, you know, um, you know waiting for my next dose of, of something. And I think it was the day after the iPhone was announced, and he had one for me, right? An iPhone. Del you know, your own iPhone delivered by Steve Jobs right after it comes out. It was a lovely feeling. So he decides to hook it up for me. So he gets the, on the phone to AT&T, and he's going to hook up my phone. And it's not going well. <laughs> so This is such good news for me. <laughs> eventually, he pulls the I'm Steve Jobs card. You know, he says to the guy, I'm Steve Jobs. I'm sure the guy on the other end says, yeah, buddy, I'm Napoleon. You know, like, get out of here. But, but anyway, so he never did really get it he hooked up. He never hooked it up? <laughs> no, not that day. Yeah. But, but he was close. What did he teach you about living with cancer? 
Steve focused more on his kids, I think, than anything, and made me fight more to, to survive. And so that focus on family, you know, was something that he taught me. You care deeply that you watch your daughter. Yes. As she continues to grow and... It's about her. What, what was her life going to be like if I died? That's really motivating. It was around that time that Kelly decided to commit himself to something even bigger. And why he approached Stanford University and a wealthy client named Hazel Plattner with the idea of setting up a school dedicated to human-centered design. He thought that was a great idea, and um, he said he'd help me. And I said, oh, thank you. And then I went back, and the development... You had no idea what he meant? No. The development officer at Stanford said, when a billionaire says, I'll help you, you should call him back right away. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it turns out Hasso funded the whole thing. He said, $35 million. Yeah, yeah. He said, how much you need? I wish I'd have said $80 million. I, <laughs> he said yes to whatever I said, I think. Kelly now runs a groundbreaking and wildly popular Hasso Platinum Institute of Design at Stanford, the D School. Okay. It is recognized as the first program of its kind dedicated to teaching design thinking as a tool for innovation, not just to designers, but to students from all different disciplines. I think you can follow your noses a little bit around that, like where's the big idea, where's the excitement? Twice as many Stanford grad students want to take classes as are seats available. The lucky 500 students in the program augment their master's degree studies in business, law, medicine, engineering, and the arts by solving problems collaboratively and creatively and immersing themselves in the methodology Kelly's made famous. But there are no degrees. It is something Steve Jobs talked him out of. He said, I don't want somebody with one of your flaky degrees. <laughs> Very Steve, right? I don't want them working for me. Yeah, yeah, I don't want them working for me. If they just have your flaky degree. But if they have a computer science degree or a business degree, and then they've come and have our way of thinking on top of that, I'm really excited about it. Today, his cancer is in remission. He spends more time doing the things that he cares about most, including tinkering in his workshop with his 15-year-old daughter. So, Claire, tell me this. What happens here? Everything. <laughs> really everything. Yeah, so Claire and I come here to do projects together. Our big project is, is right over there presently, which is to make a 3D printer. It's called a printer bot. And it's a little machine that makes 3D objects, like a printer that puts ink on a page. Yeah. This makes something three-dimensional. His love of making things is as much a part of his DNA as his appreciation for the car, which he calls the most important object in our lives. So why do you like it? What does it mean to you? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's about the same vintage as me, and it, um, and it just, uh, it's just makes everybody smile. Okay, I like the sound of the motor. Okay. Almost every day you can find David Kelly driving his 54 Chevy pickup truck between Stanford and IDEO, inspiring the design thinkers of tomorrow and quietly shaping the future. My theory is that sometimes life squeezes out the best of us. I've never heard that, but that really resonates with me. So if I could write the first line of your epitaph, it might be David Kelly, help people find the confidence in their creativity. That'd be lovely. And change the world. Yeah. Go to 60minutesovertime.com for a guided tour with Charlie Rose, sponsored by Pfizer.